I started today by immediately finding my 10 millimeter socket right where it belongs. That means one of two things. Either today is gonna go super smoothly with nothing but luck and success, or I just used up 100% of my luck by finding this 10 millimeter socket. We've got two different models today. Each of them need eight parts. So we need a total of 16 parts with the two different designs. Eight of them are coming out of this. This is Ultem, which is a high performance engineering plastic. It's actually one of my favorite things to machine. And then we have this, which is new to me. This is Polysophone. I believe it's abbreviated PSU. It's another fancy engineering plastic. From what I found online, this basically machines just like Ultem. It's just a different color and has some different like thermal properties. This is the first part we'll be machining today. Um, no clue what it is. It's a small plastic part. That's what I know. It's got some funky details down here and some holes. Otherwise, it's pretty simple. And on the back side, it's got this little undercut. The other part has this big long slot going down it. It's got a couple of holes and then a hole here that is modeled with sharp edges. I have clarified with the customer, I can put a five thou radius in those corners, which means I get to pull this guy back out. This is the 10 thou diameter end mill. Now everyone is so concerned that I don't make money on these parts. So we'll go through some of the financials on this job. My material costs are $143.44. I quoted these parts for $1,200 plus shipping. My total shop overhead is $450 a month for this machine and about $200 a month for power. The building is on my property, which I own. Obviously you could take my mortgage and like divide out a portion of that for this, but whether I was doing Audacity Micro or not, my mortgage would not change. So in terms of my calculations for if I'm making money on a job, I don't consider the building. There are of course other costs related to running the business. For example, coolant and tooling for the machine, which I haven't covered in those numbers since I didn't have to buy any special tooling for this job, but that tooling does still wear out and still cost money. There's also these fun things called taxes, which I'm not covering in these numbers, but generally like I'm a one man shop. I run pretty lean. I don't have much overhead. Okay, so with these numbers, job cost $1,200, direct cost, that's just for the material on this job, fixed overhead, that is my machine payment and electricity costs divided by the number of jobs I do on average a month. Other overhead, that is just a guess based on kind of experience, that covers things like um, jelly bean tooling and paper towels and coolant. So for this job, I should be pocketing about $924. I don't want to call that job profit because that technically doesn't include paying myself, um, which you would include in a profit number. But since I am a one person business, uh, that is what goes back into my bank account. That is like my free cash that I get from this job that I can use either to take out and pay myself or to invest back in the business. So for all intents and purposes, for me, that is profit even if it isn't technically profit. Now, what we don't know yet is how many hours it's going to take me to do this job. Right now, I've got about 40 minutes invested in the cam work, and we'll see how long the machining takes. First step, we need this material to be a little bit more manageable. Apparently I didn't do a good enough job cleaning last time. Apparently I should have cleaned out the inside of the table saw after doing that last job. <laughs> Anyway, this should be enough material for all eight of our parts, plus plenty of uh, setup parts. And this is why I needed that Teleton millimeter socket. Uh, this is one of those cheap little import self-centering vices. They actually work really well for plastic because they've got some nice aggressive teeth on them. And don't worry, I am planning on making a mounting plate for it so I can put it directly on my fixture plate. I don't have one at the moment though, so I'm just holding it in my Saunders vise. But the way I'm making these parts, it could be like an eighth inch out of square and be perfectly fine. All right, nothing fancy on our work coordinate system. We are just gonna go 
touch off against the uh, top left corner, just like normal. Now, when I go to actually machine this, one thing you may notice is that I'm using small tools for a lot of it. So for example, for the facing pass here, where I'm you know, cleaning off all the top surfaces, I'm doing that with a 1 32nd inch end mill. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm doing all these other faces with the same tool. Like all these little stair steps here, those are all being finished with the 1 32nd inch end mill and I couldn't get anything bigger in there. What that does is eliminate any possible error in the, the tool setting process. The tool setting process is not always 100% reliable. Tools may have worn or whatever, and their heights may have slowly gotten off from each other. By doing it all with the same tool, that basically reduces the, the sources of error to like the kinematics of the machine, my tool path, and a thermal growth. And material movement, which I suspect will be our biggest problem in this project. <laughs> The first test looks like it's done. The parts are still attached, which is good. I did six at a time, if that wasn't obvious by now. That worked. All right, six parts. Let's see if they're good. So these are not looking that bad. Um, if you look at it kind of from this angle with the lights on it just right, you can see there's a little bit of a burr here. Uh, we'll see if I can get rid of some of that in the machine. I may just need to kind of rub it off. Does it come off if I just scrape at it? Maybe sorta? I'm not sure. So I'll play with that burr some and see if I can improve that at all. But otherwise, all of our features are there. Uh, these are nice and transparent at this thickness. Backside finish wise is looking pretty good. Um, that little step is there. That corner right there is also nice, is nice and tight. Um, that corner right there. That was cut with that 10 thou end mill. So now it's just a matter of getting the tab off and like I said, checking these dimensions. So let's try the tab first. There's a couple different ways you can do this. Ideally, they just yank right off the tab. Uh, let's see, here's the one that fell off earlier. We'll start with that one. And we'll try flush cutters. No matter what we do, we're going to have to sand off this tab. And that's okay. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Um, can we get it smaller if we use the knife? I don't think I'm gonna, going to. Yeah. Nope, I don't think this is gonna work. Yeah, okay, so flush cutter seems to be the way on this. And then we will uh, sand off, sand this until it's flat. I may have to leave a little bit of extra thickness on this surface here so that I can like lap it to final size. Um, but we should do some measurements. I'm gonna start by measuring these holes with some gauge pins. This one should be loose. Okay, that one fits but is loose. This one should not go. It kind of gets started in the hole, which I don't like. I think my holes are a little bit oversized. 
This one should be tight, but should just barely fit. Which is what I would call it. So, I don't know. Maybe that is close enough. Our holes might be a couple tenths oversized, but not out of spec. All right, let's do some micrometer checking. Just make sure my anvils are clean and make sure my zero is working out right. Now you may notice this time I'm working on a paper plate. That was actually a suggestion from the comments. Lots of people said that I should get like trays and stuff, but one person mentioned that um, paper plates work just fine. And I have to agree, it does make it easier to see the parts and it'll also keep them from running away. So let's see, this is supposed to be exactly 200 thou wide. Under how many different measurements I can get. I think it's that tab is a little bit wider. So I'm gonna try uh, measuring, making sure I'm not hitting that tab. There we go. So I'm reading um, 199.8 thou. So 0.1998. And these are supposed to be 0 0.20000. So we are approximately two tenths undersized, um, which I can live with. There's still plenty of safety margin there. Oop, that time I read it one tenth undersized. Yeah, okay. Two tenths undersized seems to be consistent, which actually could be the measuring force on this uh, micrometer because it could be warping this part. So. That I'm happy with. I already had the, the wear diameter of that tool dialed in, so I'm not too surprised. It's not like tool deflection is going to be big on these parts. All right, thickness. This is our wild card. Probably do that one with my fingers. So I'm not hitting that tab there. I'm measuring 0.0342. My measurement is supposed to be 0.034. So... Uh, get, we're about two thou oversized, on, or excuse me, two tenths oversized on this one, um, which is definitely within spec. Now this one here is kind of interesting. <laughs> Everywhere we're out of spec seems to be touched by this tool here, the slitting saw that I use to tab off the part on the bottom. So I think by just adjusting this tool a tiny bit, we should be able to get those features in spec. Everything else I measured, like the, the width of this gap here, was good. So I think the only thing we need to do is get that dialed in, and then we should be able to run production on these. And bad parts go into the red bin. This next batch is looking pretty good. I changed my speeds and feeds on this contour here, making them a little bit more aggressive. And that seems to have dealt with that burr issue. So that part is good. I just need to measure these ones and hopefully they are shippable. About 40 minutes later and I have a plate here that has 12 good parts on it. Now I need to ship eight of those parts. So I have a couple extras, but I'm just assuming that I'm going to lose some in the detabbing process, which I haven't done yet. And if I have any extra left, oh no, it's not a big deal. Uh, best case scenario, they reorder them at some point. Worst case scenario, I throw them away. You can see here out of the inch of material I started with, I'm probably still left with like a quarter inch. And because of that, that means I still have 11 inches of the original bar of material left, which I'm gonna keep here in my uh, Ultem drawer. And while I don't build the price of the scrap material into my quilt, it is always nice to have it around. Um, I get a lot of jobs out of Ultim. Like I said, it's my favorite thing in the machine. And so hopefully that will, you know, be the materials for some job in the future. Off camera, I did go ahead and cut these little jello cubes. These are the material for the next part. Now, unfortunately, this next part is a little bit larger. It's longer, so I can't get six out of one layer. I only get one, so... Two cubes may not even be enough. I might have to go through three cubes of material. These do make me strangely hungry. Our second part is now running.
All right, that seemed to have at least kind of worked. It's very fuzzy though. I guess, well, maybe most of that was coolant. We'll use our razor blade technique again, or at least try this again. Oh, yep, that worked well. I don't know how well it's coming across here, but the finishes on the side of this just aren't as good. And I'm not sure why, the speeds and feeds were the same. Apparently you can't just treat this like Ultim, which is kind of what I had originally thought. Um, my slot here is awfully uh, furry. There's a lot of burrs going on there. So I'll need to do something about that. Though they do seem to come off relatively easy. Uh, the whole part's just kind of furry. It, it machined like a much softer plastic than I was expecting. And so I may need to revise some of my, my speeds and feeds and stuff. The burrs do come off fairly nicely though. I wouldn't mind doing this for eight parts if I had to. But I assume when I get those um, speeds and feeds fixed, we can get my get some of these burrs fixed. It is an interesting material. Very springy. It's not like Ultim. All right, I'm going to measure this and see what we come up with. I don't know if you can see that here. I think the, uh, I just dropped it. There it is. I don't know if you can see that. I don't think the magnification works through the camera lens. Um, but this is the first good part of the second uh, design. And so I'm good to go to production. Basically all I had to do to get that to work was to adjust some tool offsets and I slowed down my feed rate. For whatever reason, this plastic liked the slower feed rate better to get rid of some of those burrs. I am still gonna have to do some handy burring, but it won't be that bad. So at this point, I think I'm just gonna go into production mode. And the parts are all done. They're packaged and they're ready to ship. It's gotten late tonight. It's about 1 a.m., but I definitely did not work the whole time. Uh, I think about six hours of actual work is safe. I did things like go and get brake pads for the car and um, get ready to put those on. Um, I also did some yard work. So yes, it is one, but I did not work that whole time. So call it six hours or so, maybe eight hours if you include the cam. Um, and some of just like the dealing with the customer. And so that works out to be an hourly rate of whatever this says right here.